Visista continued. When one is knocked about by the troubles and tribulations of earthly existence and is tired of all this, he seeks refuge from all this. I shall describe to you the progressive stages by which such a person reaches rest and peace. Either on account of an immediate cause or without one, he turns away from worldly pursuits, the pursuits of pleasure and wealth and seeks the shelter of the company of a wise person. He avoids bad company from a very great distance. So either on account of an immediate cause or without one, there might have been some personal tragedy which makes you question your previous existence, or there might not be any reason for it. You're just looking for some answer because you know you're not living in reality. One of the greatest factors and influences on our behaviour is our peer, our peer group. You see this particularly with children. We are looking for our tone, our emotional tone, to be set by our social and cultural context. And this might be okay up to a point in the development of the individual. But at some point you need to get away from it, you need to cut off from it. And the emphasis in this chapter is on the company of a, of a wise person. The blessings that flow from the company of holy men are incomparable to any other blessings. The holy man's nature is cool and peaceful. His behaviour and actions are pure. Therefore his company promotes peace and goodness in everyone who seeks it. In his company one loses fear, sinfulness comes to an end, and one grows in purity. Even the love and affection that the gods and the angels possess are nothing compared to the limitless love that flows from the holy ones. This sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Off and often enough I've mentioned various caveats. It's very easy to get sucked into something which is not spiritual. The very fact that somebody might be regarded as a holy one, that somebody might be regarded as a guru, that somebody has disciples, gives them the quality of an alpha person, an alpha male, which can hook into certain parts of the psyche in a very unhelpful manner. And if you're emotionally damaged, which most of us are, you need to be very careful what you're getting out of this. Maybe emotional healing is possible in such an environment. But what kind of dependencies are being set up here? Will you be looking for attention from the holy man? Are you going to quiver whenever his gaze alights upon you? All of this is extremely unhelpful in the long term. It might have some short term benefits, but spiritually it's disastrous. Really, you'd, if possible, you don't want to get roped into such a situation. You can see it on YouTube videos where teachers, who are probably very good teachers, are giving a talk to an audience or questions and answers. I don't know about you, but it's, these situations often strike me as very, very inauthentic. There's a lot of collusion going on. There's something insincere and unreal, although everybody involved is very nice and very genuine. But put them into that situation where you've got an adored guru, a wise man, and otherwise intelligent people, then we seem to get an inauthentic infantilism, infantilism generated. And you get the impression that underneath it all there's a lot of emotional damage. So, I, so my suggestion, my advice would be that with any holy man or holy one, any guru, is to take what you need, take what's on offer. If the guru is genuine, then this will suit them fine. They don't want to be dealing with people's emotional needs. 
All they really want is to be turning people to the truth. That's all a guru wants. The guru doesn't want adoration. Doesn't want, the guru doesn't want compliments. So really, you have to be spiritually selfish when you go to the holy person. You take what you need from the situation. And if you're not getting what you need, if all you're getting is a nice buzz and hopes for the future, then forget it. Going to a holy person is only of use if they are reminding you of your true nature. And we need as many reminders as possible, whether in person, whether from videos, whether from books. When one engages oneself in the performance of right action, his intelligence rests in peace and reflects the truth like a perfect mirror. It is then that the meaning of the scriptural declarations becomes abundantly clear. The wise man radiates wisdom and goodness. Then seeking to free himself from the cage of ignorance, he flies away from pleasure towards the unconditioned bliss. So the wise man is the enlightenment practitioner. And right action, the performance of right action, is just doing what needs to be done. And once that's done, you turn the attention back on itself. It is a great misfortune to pursue pleasures. Although the wise man rejects them, they create some uneasiness in his heart. He is supremely happy, therefore, when he does not find himself in pleasurable situations. So this is the Enlightenment practitioner. And it seems a bit peculiar to be feeling uneasy about pleasurable situations. The fact is, it's actually harder to deal with positive states than negative states. When you feel happy, you just want to go with it and forget any, any kind of spiritual understanding. It's when you feel unhappy that you want to reject it and that, that reminds you to turn back in yourself. But when you're happy, let's just go for it. This teaching's working, I'm feeling blissful, I'm happy. And then you forget it, you've forgotten it. So that's the uneasiness. The uneasiness arises because we feel that we're reaping the rewards of our spiritual practice. And maybe this is the bliss of consciousness. It's just transient happiness. So that's the uneasiness.